शांति शारदा देवी राम जगदुर पाद पद मेतोश्वा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुह नम श्रेयतिराजा विवेकानंदसूर सच्चिस्वूपय स्वामी नेतापहारिणे We are extremely delighted that Swami Sarvastanand Ji from England is joining us today, and he will speak on yoga in daily life, ethical and moral principles, yama niyama, as the basis of yoga. All of us know that Patanjali has eight limbed yoga, Ashtanga yoga. Unfortunately, the present day. There is a tendency to reduce us to Shastanga Yoga. We begin with Asana. Everybody begins with Asana, thinking that Asana is Yoga. Asana is one part of Yoga called Hatha Yoga, and Yama and Yama are the basic, fundamental, moral principles. As the bedrock on which the entire system of Yoga stands, and Yama and Yama are really emphasized. when we speak of yoga we start with asana and go to dhyana and rarely samadhi is spoken of people think asana and dhyana and pranayama are the main components of yoga but no unless you have the moral basis the ethical basis spirituality is not possible all the great spiritual masters sri ramakrishna swami vivekananda have repeatedly emphasized purity of purpose brahmacharya self control truthfulness and selfishness as very very important basis of yoga today we will have a talk by swami sarvastanand ji he is the minister in charge of the ramakrishna vedanta center in the united kingdom and he is a, a fairly senior monk of our ramakrishna order and he's been serving there for a very long time and we are happy that he obliged us by agreeing to give this talk on yoga in daily life ethical and moral principles yama and niyama as the basis of yoga swami sarvastanand ji the floor is now yours ओम जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुह रेवेट स्वामी आत्मप्रियानंद जी महाराज इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेजर टू पार्टिसिपेट इन दिस वंडरफुल सेमिनार ऑन योगा on the eve of the international yoga day and rkm very in collaboration with iucys is organizing this seminar on fascinating facets of the multifaceted yoga it's a very interesting topic because yoga as maharaj rightly said people do not understand or give equal importance to all the eight ashtanga the eight limbed yoga as it is popularly known ashtanga yoga of patanjali so there are fascinating facets a lot of facets which we perhaps overlook in our everybody wants to meditate or at a much grosser level it is asana which is very popular asana and pranayama the physical yoga but people forget as maharaj rightly said it is the yama and niyama which forms the foundation of this entire ashtanga yoga only when that is strong the asana pranayama pratyahara dhyana dharana dhyana and samadhi there are eight steps which is the goal of yoga so uh this is a very interesting topic 
especially the ethical and moral principles, yama and niyama, as the basis of yoga. So we all know, according to the yoga philosophy, which accepts two realities, purusha and prakriti, that it is only through ignorance that the soul has been joined with nature or prakriti. The entire nature, the physical universe, the mental universe, and everything that we see around us is prakriti. The gunas of prakriti in various permutations and combinations give rise to this created world. And the goal according to yoga philosophy is to get rid of this control of nature over us. Swamiji very nicely put it that the goal of all religions, whether they accept uh, Patanjali's yoga or not, directly or indirectly, they are all aimed at one goal, that is how to get rid of nature's control over us, Prakriti's control over the Purusha. So Purusha wants to regain its true nature. I mean, that is the goal of every religion and especially yoga. So we all know the famous quote of Swamiji. He says, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within. The divinity within is nothing but our real nature, which is Purusha. And how do we do it? By controlling nature, both external and internal. So he says, do this either by work or worship or psychic control, which is the goal of Patanjali's yoga or Raj Yoga, as he called it, or philosophy by one or more or all of this and be free. That is the whole of religion. All other things, they are secondary, whether it's dogmas, rituals, books, temples, forms, and all other details. So the yogi, according to the system of yoga, Patanjali's yoga, tries to achieve this goal through psychic control. So unless we are free, un unless we are able to free ourselves from the clutches of nature, we are slaves and nature will dictate, our gunas will dictate, prakriti will dictate. And we have to do a, her bidding, prakriti's bidding. So the yogi claims that he who controls the mind can control the matter also. So mind being more subtle than matter, Mind is, of course, finer matter, but it is internal nature. If we control, you can control. This is a wonder. This is one of the basic ideas behind Patanjali's yoga, that the internal internal nature or the mind, the sukshma sharira, is much higher than the external, and obviously, it is more difficult to grapple with. So it's easy to control external nature, and but it is very difficult to control the mind. We have so many uh, uh, sentences in the Vedas, the Upanishads, even Bhagavad Gita, uh, Sri Krishna says the mind is very difficult to control. But for that reason, it doesn't mean that we should not attempt. But there is a system. Patanjali is very systematic. He says no, you don't have to just control your mind at the first step. You start from the basic basic steps. That is, uh, try to practice yama and niyama. We'll see what it is and why it is the basis of all the yogas. So, uh, no doubt, one who has conquered internal nature, that is the mind, controls the whole universe. The whole universe, the external universe, becomes his servant. That is the content of the vibhuti pada. If you see, we will come to the outline of yoga philosophy as Patanjali has explained it. So Patanjali's yoga propounds these methods of gaining this control over prakriti or nature. Forces higher than that which we know in physical nature, which science has more or less controlled, they will have to be subdued. The internal forces have to be sub subdued. And the body is nothing but the external crust of the mind. So we are primarily the mind, but we have an external crust, which is the body. So giving so much importance to the pranayama and asana, it is just taking care of the crust. We have not yet reached the core. But before we reach the core, there are certain fundamental things we have to follow. These are the yama and niyama. So internal fine forces 
the prana controls these forces the fine forces of the mind the nervous forces they are all uh, vital forces which control the external body these forces which we call the mind take up the gross matter from outside that is how swami ji explains it takes up the gross it manufactures as it were the body and the the finer forces control it so if you control the finer forces we can control the external so these forces are the internal forces if we control as i said it's easy to control the external but they are the gross uh, they are the uh, the fine forces are the uh, the physical forces are the gross manifestations of the fine forces within us the nervous energy and all those things so we have to remember this anything we do in the external world impacts the finer forces just as the thoughts and finer forces impact the external forces the external body the crust so that is why we have so many diseases known as psychosomatic diseases most diseases have their origin in the mind partially it is the mind which is responsible for all the problems of the external world the annamai kosha so what is morality or ethics why do we have to practice yama and niyama swami ji gives a wonderful explanation i have never seen a better explanation of morality a very scientific and rational approach he says what is morality making the subject that is purusha strong by attuning it to the absolute to the purusha or the atman so that the finite nature ceases to have control over us that is the fundamental idea behind morality and the ethical theories and then he says there are two components of every action one is the subject and the object so the one aim of life of all religions of all yoga for every spiritual endeavor is to make the subject the master of the object so purusha we have to uh, uh, we have to identify ourselves with the purusha and not with prakriti so my struggle will be to make myself so strong that i can co conquer the external as well as internal environment and the external events will not impact me so change according to swami ji morality the whole basis of morality or ethics or yama and niyama is always subjective the conquest of evil the so called evil in the world that we see around us can come only by the change in the subject alone but how to achieve this now patanjali yoga sutras as you all know it begins begins with samadhi pada it should have started with sadhana pada but samadhi pada is given before the sadhana pada the actual process because patanjali would like us to know what is the goal that we are attempting to reach the goal of yoga chitta vritti nirodha is what we do but how to attain to that chitta vritti nirodha and reach kaivalya or sama samadhi so apart from the kaivalya pada which has 34 sutras which is the last part and the vibhuti pada which is 55 sutras which is the third part in between there is this sadhana pada it is in the sadhana pada the yama and niyama have been very clearly described not only described how to <clears throat> but what is the result if we practice these yamas and niyamas briefly uh, to put it briefly yama and niyama yama means external control niyama can be defined as internal control we'll see what it is so yoga as i said the first second and third and fourth sutras give the whole essence or the goal of yoga that is yoga is the chitta yoga means chitta vritti nirodha suppression of or the modifications of the mind which is known as chitta we all of us know that then in that state once you control the chitta vritti what happens tada drashtu the seer the self swarupe avasthanam he abides in his own essential nature swarupa swarupe as tada drashtu swarupe avasthanam so this gives the gist of what yoga is all about and what about the rest of the time when we are not in a state of yoga when we are not when we have not reached that goal of chitta vritti nirodha or that kaivalya or samadhi 
what happens when in the normal case in the normal state of mind in the normal uh, the way we live in the world on other occasions all other occasions itaratra vritti sarupyam itaratra means there is identity between the seer and the modifications of the mind this is the whole secret of yoga as you think so you become that's the famous quote of buddha buddha said as your mental modification so is your identity we identify with the changing modifications of the mind and that gives us a temporary or a false or a transient identity and we suffer because of that so the whole goal of yoga is to just somehow through all these ashtanga eight steps starting with yama and niyama to control our to reach or to identify sarupya uh, to uh, swa swarupe avasthanam to abide in our eternal self the purusha it it recognizes itself as the purusha not as the plaything of prakruti the modifications of guna make us jump about in nature so that is because the vritti is make us dance to its tunes tune the modifications of the mind make us feel uh, vritti sarupya that the identity is dangerous that we have to disconnect ourselves so now the goal as i said uh, the 34th sutra the beautiful sutra of the kaivalya pada 34th sutra that is the last last uh, yoga sutra he and he concludes with iti iti means this is the whole of yoga purushartha <coughs> shunya naam guna naam prati prasava guna means gunas of prakriti complete liberation or the highest samadhi or the highest uh, realization complete liberation or the power of consciousness is established so swarupe avasthanam which i said we become one with the purusha when it is pratishtha in swaswarupa when the gunas of prakriti guna naam the qualities of prakriti are known as guna sattva rajas and tamas so prati prasava prakriti they have no further purpose to fulfill artha shunya naam for purusha iti iti means this indicates the end of the scripture so prati prasava means we they go back to their original source the the complete liberation or kaivalya takes place that is the ultimate goal of yoga now how uh do we uh what place do we assign to yama and niyama in this so the 26 sutra of the same chapter of this sadhana pada says that is kaivalya pada the last uh, sutra i said but 26 sutra gives a beautiful description how to go about doing this how to follow this yama and niyama so you have to destroy the ignorance by unbroken practice of discrimination so viveka khyatir aviplava hanopaya hana means liberation upaya means the means for liberation is only through discriminative knowledge knowledge means khyati the discriminative knowledge which is completely clear and devoid of all confusion vrittis confuse our mind vrittis give us a false sense of identity so that is known as this confusion or disorder caused by the changing states of the mind is known as aviplava this which is complete aviplava viplava means confusion aviplava means that state where which is completely devoid of confusion so vivek swami ji in his raj yoga beautifully Uh, explains this saying is the real goal of goal of practice of yoga is the discrimination between the real and the unreal nitya nitya vastu viveka vedanta also says we have to do that knowing that the purusha is not nature that separation purusha is not nature it has nothing to do with nature pure consciousness has nothing to do with nature that it is neither mind nor matter and that because it is not nature it cannot change it has to be changeless eternal it is only nature the prakriti that changes combining recombining dissolving continually it happens so through constant practice 
we have to discriminate and then only the avidya or ignorance will vanish and then what remains the purusha will begin to shine in its real nature swa swarupe avasthanam omniscient omnipotent omnipresent this is how swami ji explains now 29th sutra of this sadhana pada says yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadaya ashta angani the eight limbs of yoga all of us know it begins with yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana and the eighth one is samadhi these are the eight limbs now raj yoga swami ji says uh, there are many things we 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 will go into this uh, a little in detail the 30th sutra the very next sutra says what are the yamahas what are the yamas ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha that is ahimsa means non killing or harmlessness that is a better word satya veracity or truthfulness asteya abstention from stealing or not taking that which does not belong to you rightfully belong to you even keeping that is stealing abstention from stealing asteya brahmacharya that is continence literally it means dwelling in brahman brahmacharya but uh, in common practice it is the practice of continence and then finally aparigraha that is uh, non possession abstinence from covetousness or you can say uh, we have a tendency to accumulate things so that abstinence is aparigraha so these are the five yamas or uh, restraints but mind you the difference between yama and niyama are subtle yama are external control by controlling the mind by controlling the externals so ahimsa is that we should live in such a way this ultimately will see that it leads to the higher states which we need to practice the pratyahara dharana these are not so easy to practice every time we neglect one of these five yamas and the five niyamas you will find that it becomes extremely difficult to control the modifications of the minds or vrittis because these vrittis are caused by this uh, lack of practice or self control by not practicing these yamas and niyamas so we have to live so that no harm or pain it's not just not killing others no harm or pain should be caused by us in thoughts words or even deeds deeds of course but even in thoughts and words we don't know the power of the spoken word how we casually use words and it can lead to so much of trouble for ourselves and for others so even words even thoughts silent thoughts which we harbor for other people hatred and uh, jealousy and all those things so in a positive sense if you see this means that we must cultivate love for all in a negative sense of course we should avoid himsa but that doesn't mean we have to be dry people we have to be we have to see the atman within everybody the divine within everybody as swami ji said and in a positive way ahimsa means cultivating love for all all creatures everything that is created we should create love for all then in satya of course thakur's uh, main sri ram krishna used to say spirituality consists in this kali yuga satya is the tapasya what do you mean by satya making the heart and the lips thought and deeds the same the words that we utter should come from the bottom of the heart and we should be careful not to hurt others satya doesn't mean that one has to be uh, as holy mother said one should never speak a truth which harms others so we need not hurt others by saying what is cruel even if it happens to be true on such occasions i think it is a better uh, it is better that we just keep silent rather than tell any untruth but making the heart and lips the same is the essence of satya as sri ram krishna explains asteya is not enough it is not enough to abstain from theft 
we should not harbor any feeling that we covet this thing or that thing either towards persons or objects it's not necessarily objects alone even toward persons even towards persons if we have some kind of feeling that this is mine he or she is mine that is also a kind of asteya we try to uh, grab certain things which really do not belong to us we should remember always it's a good idea to remember that nothing in this world in this world of prakriti in the world of gunas really belong to us at the best we are just borrowers we just keep it we are trustees as swami ji used to say we are trustees for all the wealth that has been created so created by us so it is our duty to borrow no more from the world that is why simple living helps a lot then we absolutely there is enough in this world for everybody's need but not for everybody's greed as mahatma gandhi said so to make full and proper use of the things that we need we we should stick to that that in spirit is practicing asteya it's not just stealing something so taking more than what we need and wasting it is some kind of stealing from the rest of mankind and we do it we not only use it but sometimes destroy certain things or waste certain things so whatever we don't need even if we don't need we take it and then waste it is also a form of asteya of course brahmacharya swami ji says continence in chastity word thought and deed is what is meant by brahmacharya so this one has to even patanjali describes it that way the commentators of patanjali to be freed from the idea of sex is to achieve purity of heart so sex and attachment are in intimately connected and attachment of any sort good or bad is an obstacle to spiritual knowledge whatever makes us combined with the gunas of prakriti the idea is to be free the idea is to be detached yoga is actually defined more as viyoga to separate the prakriti from purusha so it's a kind of detachment that we are practicing and brahmacharya is absolutely essential now aparigraha means can be best defined as abstention of greed and also abstention from receiving gifts so swami ji here says something very nice he says the mind of the man it's not just accepting gifts is evil the mind of the man who receives this gift swami ji says is acted upon by the mind of the giver if he has certain selfish intentions we partake the it is definitely our mind is the impacted by the mind of the giver so it's not so easy to accept a thing it will always be conditional so the receiver is likely to be degenerated so and, no, and more more than that swami ji says it makes us slavish it is destroys the independence of mind and makes us slavish so this may seem to be a very hard saying that is very hard thing not to accept anything but patanjali is trying to describe the six strict disciplines uh, for a dedicated yogi one who has a higher goal in mind not just the asanas and pranayama some kind of yoga which will make us healthy uh, maybe uh, make us healthy and strong that is not the goal of yoga these disciplines yama and niyama are meant for those who really want to uh, reach the conclusion of yoga attain to the highest state which yoga uh, promises to take us to so more in everyday world some gifts which are given out of love they may be relatively harmless but if as long as they are as a, a token of genuine affection we should not uh, make it a obsession we should not be paranoid about that that i'll not touch not accept a single gift sometimes if it is given with love and reverence without any uh, expectation of return it will not uh, uh, means result in aparigraha so that we have to remember now this universe this laws or the yama and niyama are not exclusive to patanjali's yoga system that's why in 31st sutra he beautifully says jati desha kala samaya anavachinnah sarvabhauma mahavratam these are the great vows 
if you compare all the religions of the world you will find that these are the these uh, yamas or niyamas both they are the universal vows you will find a part of every religion they are unbroken or anavichinna means unbroken by time place purpose and caste rules these are the great universal vows so you'll find the bible in the bible and all the scriptures of the world they insist on this yama and niyama for that reason we should not think that it is unique to the system of patanjali alone so patanjali's yoga ashtanga yoga can form the basis of all religions that's another reason why yama and niyama are essential they may differ asanas may not be there in other religions pranayama also they may not practice the way patanjali tells us to practice but there is not a single religion according to swami ji where yama and niyama do not form the basis so if one practices yama and niyama then he is fit to practice other higher forms of spiritual practice including patanjali's uh, ashtanga yoga so that is what we have to remember sarvabhauma means universal that is what he says then uh, then we come to the niyamas now let us briefly see what these niyamas are shaucha santosha tapaha swadhyaya ishvara pranidhanani niyamah so what are these these are the internal and external purification that is shaucha it's not just the external cleanliness that is meant here though shaucha really means cleanliness but it is both internal and external purification then santosha contentment holy mother used to say in bengali uh, uh, there is no virtue higher than contentment we don't realize in this universe of ours in this world of ours how people discontentment makes people suffer there is no santosha one is not satisfied with whatever he gets so that contentment also is important austerity or penance that is tapas tapaha study and recitation of sacred scriptures swadhyaya which includes the practice of japa according to swami ji we'll see that and devotion to the supreme lord these are the five niyamas this is uh, sutra number 32 so shaucha there are two parts to it the sages always say shaucha is both external and internal the purification of the body by water earth or other materials which we use is external purification as bathing etc but the purification of mind how can we practice that it is by practicing virtues like truth it is these virtues the yamas which we discuss satya asti by practicing them we practice inner purification so both are necessary it is not that one should be internally pure and externally one has to be dirty so cleanliness is next to godliness as they say so we have to be very particular about external purity but at the same time the yamas which we discussed earlier they have to be practiced so that there is some internal purity also brahmacharya is one of them aste aparigraha these are all meant for internal purity so when both are there internal as external Uh, one will be a yogi if a man thinks that he is the dwelling place of the atman he will naturally feel that that his body and mind have to be kept clean otherwise how can i ask the divine to take a seat in our heart so moreover external cleanliness is important because of the psychological effect upon us some people if they don't take a bath they feel so uneasy though they may be clean but still that idea the psychological impact or effect is also very important the internal organs of the body also must be cleansed that is we have to follow a mental diet so, say we practice all these yamas so that mental food and good mental food avoiding gossip light entertainment which can lead to anxieties addictions aversions all types of uh, uh, things the external things that we do which result in some kind of uh, you may say anxieties and aversions and addiction should be avoided so one has to uh, resort to cleanliness of 
the mind that is internal cleanliness by maintaining a constant alertness you see that is known as pragna aparadha pragna means the alertness or the awareness the consciousness if we just slip a little bit then we have a tendency to gravitate down to the gross level so by constant alertness this virtue has to be practiced that is this shaucha has to be practiced now we come to santosha patanjali <clears throat> says contentment means acceptance of one's lot in life whatever comes to us untroubled by any kind of envy or restlessness because envy and jealousy gives rise to restlessness that is harmful chitta vrittis of the chitta rise and that gives rise to restlessness so religious preachers all over the world they always say that one has to be content but here it is not referred i mean it is material contentment it's not spiritual contentment so it does not mean one has to be indifferent otherwise if you say that i am content uh, and i'll not do any spiritual practices no it is not some indifference contentment should not be confused with indifference as members of a community service in a spirit of service of god in man a, a useful service one can never be content one has to do till the end of one's life and we must take contentment in a positive way it it is a positive duty of all of us to help our less fortunate neighbors or under privileged people so the idea behind contentment is there should not be any motive of personal gain or advantage that is what is meant by contentment it is a entirely subjective feeling that is why holy mother said santosher moto ar gun hoy na means there is no virtue higher than santosha so that is the importance contentment lack of contentment causes so much of restlessness anxiety worries like trying to live up with the joneses as they say our neighbors have certain things we don't have it we try to strive to get it so that affects our chitta vrittis the chitta vrittis are uh, go into a restless mode so to prevent that one has to practice contentment this is one important niyama and the next is austerity or tapas now this sanskrit word tapas is been used by patanjali in a, in in a primary sense it means that which generates heat or energy tapa tapas so actually it in 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 if we try to understand it a little deeply it actually means conserving energy and directing it towards the practice of yoga we are expending so much of energy in our daily lives and that leaves us very little time for yoga the true yoga towards the union with purusha or the atman so we have to conserve energy that is what tapas actually does self discipline is not something which we have to do as like torturing your body and all this tapasya normally if it is not done with the proper attitude it can lead to vanity that i am doing these things not it tapasya should not be practiced for the sake of practicing tapasya this self discipline is necessary to conserve energy so we must exercise self discipline so that we can control our physical appetites and passions which drain away a lot of our energy so austerity for austerity sake if we do it de- degenerates into a perverse cult of self torture we find many of the uh, uh, especially in the some of the monastic orders the self torture is uh, becomes uh, an obsession and one should not forget that there is a great danger in that also the end should not be forgotten uh, the, the, the yeah. end should be for, the end should be uh, i mean the means are important what you do the motive is important that is why very beautifully the gita defines three kinds of austerities said uh, very clearly uh, uh, the gita gives a beautiful explanation of austerity or tapas saying reverence for the holy spirits to, to tell you in brief the seers the teachers the rishis the sages that is one kind of tapas straight forwardness harmlessness physical cleanliness and sexual purity 
these are the austerities of the body sharirik tapah to speak without causing pain to other they are all yama and niyama if you see gita has classified these yama and niyama and that is nothing but practice of yama and niyama ultimately can be defined as practicing tapasya tapasya of the body tapasya of the mind and tapasya of the spirit <coughs> that is uh, speech then tapasya of speech is been described practice of body uh, bodily tapasya we saw in gita the practice of uh, speaking in a way that does not cause pain to another to be truthful and to say always what is kind and beneficial and to study the scriptures regularly to recite the mantra also swami ji will say that is also part of tapasya so this practice is called austerity or tapasya of the speech tapa the tapa tapa of the speech then there is a tapa of the mind at the physical level at the spoken level or the level of the speech the practice of serenity sympathy meditation upon the atman withdrawal pratyahar of the mind from the sense objects and integrity of motive is called sankalpa that we do a, a, a good sankalpa is called austerity of the mind so these are the three tapas so we have to understand this niyama in uh, the light of the teachings of the gita now regarding swadhyaya we come to the uh, second last niyama before ishwar pranidhan uh, pranidhana we come to swadhyaya where normally swami ji defines it as repeating of the vedas and the other mantras by which the sattva material in us is uh, in the body and the mind is purified that is the correct definition swadhyaya means not just any reading there may be we can read any number of books any number of texts but do they purify the sattva material sattva shuddhi does it take place if it takes place then it is called study so swami ji says there are three types of repetition of mantra one is verbal he gives a lot of swadhyaya according to swami ji is mainly repetition of these mantras or the Uh, shastras or the sutras and other things which help us to think about the purusha or the atman or the highest reality the pure consciousness so he says there are verbal semi verbal and mental so he says the verbal repetition is the lowest and the inaudible or the mental repetition is the highest the repetition which is loud is verbal the next one where only the lips move but no sound is heard and the inaudible repetition of mantra accompanied by the highest thinking of its meaning that is why all the japa uh, in our sadhana in the upasana that we do uh, one is advised to do only mental repetition even the lips should not move because that is the highest form of swadhyaya so these are swami ji's words he says Uh, accompanied with the thinking of its meaning the purpose of the mantra where does it lead us to the mantra leads us because the sound has come from brahman himself shabda brahma om has come from brahman it is the manifestation of brahman as it goes the shabda and artha form this whole universe so we have to follow the reverse process the sadhana of mantra sadhana is nothing but following the reverse process from gross to subtle subtle to the source of the mantra so the mantra according to swami ji uh, is this swadhyaya nothing means nothing but uh, practicing the mantra then we come to ishwara pranidhana that means worshiping god and surrendering one's will to him now uh, we have about 15 minutes i'll just try to find we will try to see what the practice of this virtues uh, do to us so we will just uh, see yeah now we come directly come to this just five uh, uh, sutras we will discuss because one has to realize the importance unlike the vibhuti pada where the benefits of doing different sadhanas are explained in this sadhana pada what happens with when we practice ahimsa what happens when we practice asteya 
there are specific and re specific reasons why this yama and niyama have to be practiced so we'll just in the next 10 minutes we'll just discuss its importance what it does to us how does it help in our day to day life in our sadhana so ahimsa pratisthayam on the establishment of ahimsa it has to be practiced for a long time no doubt what happens so the phala phala uh, of that the 35th sutra says ahimsa pratisthayam tat sannidau uh, tat sannidau vaira <coughs> vaira tyagah vaira tyagah that means on the establishment of pratisthayam of ahimsa or non injury a yogi in, in a yogi what happens there is a cessation tyagah which stops uh, stoppage of hostility or hostile feelings vaira vaira bhava by coming close to him i mean swami ji explains it in a beautiful way that in the presence of somebody who is practiced ahimsa it can be seen many times it has happened in his own life the tiger he was walking, walking all alone there's a famous incident even in uh, uh, a place very 5 miles away from this place a bull attacked swami ji sturdy and all other disciples were there a ferocious bull attacked them and swami ji just stood there of course he joked he said i was just calculating how far the bull will throw me but it is not as simple as that why did the bull stop and retreat so the idea is this sutra says very clearly the verse sutra number 35 says if one is established in ahimsa in his presence all enmity ceases there are many pictures many wonderful stories where buddha and all these great people have shown to be living amongst the wild beasts and they just come and uh, uh, they just don't harm because perhaps they uh, get the vibrations of ahimsa the wonderful power of ahimsa that hostility that mental agitation or hostility which uh, accompanies himsa is totally stopped so perhaps that induces a kind of uh, lack of hostility tyaga vaira tyaga in in other animals as well so it is so contagious that if one is established in non killing in his presence everybody becomes peaceful that is one so swami vivekananda says if a man gets this ideal of non injuring others before him even animals this is swami these are swami ji's words animals which are by their nature ferocious will become peaceful the tiger and lamb will play together before that yogi so that's the beautiful sculpture swami ji wanted to be done in fact in some of our ramkrishna mission ramkrishna temples you will find this tiger and the lamb are drinking water from the same pond or they are Uh, uh, meeting each other so he says when you have come to that stage when you have been established in ahimsa you will understand that you have been firmly established in non injuring ahimsa when you can create such a aura of peace around you so it is entirely subjective as we mentioned earlier these virtues are to be practiced though it is subjective it impacts by controlling inner nature we control the external nature now what happens when we practice satya so these are this is uh, sutra number 36 where it says on the establishment or pratishtaya satya pratishtaya kriya phala sh, uh, kriya phala ashrayatvam a state of ashrayatvam kriya phala means by the establishment or the of the satya or truthfulness in the yogi when these things when satya is established or one is established in truth a state of connection between his actions as uh, uh, and the consequences phala is established so what does it mean that all that the yogi says satya sankalpa as sri ramkrishna used to say that whenever he any thought came to his mind it it was true so truth whatever he utters whatever he does the consequences are in the intimately connected with the idea that is expressed so there is a intimate connection so all that the above mentioned yogi swami ji says will come true so he becomes a satya sankalp or he becomes a person whose words become true 
whatever he says that is why we see in the rishis of the past they used to bless and people used to uh, uh, go to them for blessings because they knew that the if the words of blessings of this person who is established in satya will never be untrue sri ram krishna's father sudhiram also was like that so people used to respect him for that so the yogi gets the power of attaining uh, here literally it means attaining for himself the fruits of his work but that is not the real reason the truthfulness that the yogi uh, if he uses it for a, definitely they will use it for a positive uh, purpose so swami ji says in his raj yoga i'll just quote that ki whenever the power of truth is established with you then even in dream you will not tell an untruth so swami ji explains this sutra in this way you will be true in thought word and deed sri ram krishna was an excellent example of this so that's why he said in this kali yuga it is so difficult to hold on to truth in thought word and deed it is a kind of tapasya it is a kind of niyama which we have to practice whatever you say will be truth as a consequence of this patanjali says if you hold on to truth continuously for such a long time whatever you say will be truth you may say to a man be blessed swami ji says and that man will be blessed if a man is diseased and you say to him be thou cured and he will be cured immediately so this is the power of this niyama so in our day to day life we want so many things we want somebody we want to help somebody but we feel so we are so powerless but if we develop this power it can be used for the good it's not that it can be it should be used for curing people and all those things as some of the prophets of course they did jesus did there are much higher things as uh, sri ram krishna he could change the minds of people he could bless them to overcome the limitations of the body and be free he could free people by touch so that is what happens when one is established in satya then we come to the next one 37th um, sutra of the sadhana pada which also deals with another important niyama that is asteya pratishthayam asteya pratishthayam sarva ratno pasthanam so jewels here does not mean the jewels as we understand it he says if one somebody is established in non stealing the yogi all the jewels stand near in order to serve him it should be used in a figurative way it's not that the jewels will come for a yogi there's no use but good people jewels means as akbar surrounded himself with this navaratna jewel is used in our scriptures in a figurative way that people of excellent qualities things all excellence will come to you so they literally it means sarva ratna upasthanam means uh, all ratna all the jewels come to him so sri swami ji says the more uh, swami ji gives a different example he says the more you fly from nature the more she follows you but if you don't care for her at all she becomes your slave so this is the result of asteya that nature responds to whatever whatever we need swami ji did not care for where, where the food will come from and he found that everything came to him so swami ji used to say uh, manifest that divinity within and everything else will be added unto you everything will be harmoniously arranged around you that is what it really means here this uh, sutra number 34 that all the ratnas will come to you the only that which you need of course the yogi doesn't need jewels but if we just fly from nature if we align ourselves to purusha then the nature becomes your slave and gives whatever you wants that is the import here of this verse and then we come to brahmacharya on the establishment of brahmacharya that is brahmacharya pratishthaya virya labah so virya here means energy vigor stamina strength so there are so many uh, aspects of this brahmacharya swami ji says the chaste brain has tremendous energy and gigantic will power that's why all the religious orders 
insisted on this brahmacharya this virtue of brahmacharya there is a very important niyama especially there cannot be any spiritual strength without this brahmacharya and these are swami ji's words he says without chastity there can be no spiritual strength and it is continence alone that gives wonderful control over mankind the spiritual leaders of men swami ji says have been very continent men and that is what gave them power therefore the yogi must be continent so that is another uh, the of the niyama as it is explained so these are the first we saw what these yamas and niyamas are and now patanjali in the same chapter explains to us by these different sutras what is the consequence of this why do we have to practice this yama and niyama in our daily life before even we start asana and pranayama and try to control our mind and reach the goal of yoga it is a far cry for people who have not established themselves in yama and niyama this is a important point that we have to remember because we are at the mercy of nature prakruti is always influencing us with so much effort if we try to meditate do dhyana dharana without giving any uh, importance to this yama and niyama then the chances that we will be able to meditate that itself uh, is lessened because we can't meditate when our mind is restless whenever these things self control is missing from our life so when we establish ourselves on the firm foundation of yama and niyama you will find that the consequences of these are what patanjali is explaining that we come to the last aparigraha uh, what what does it do sthairye when when we are firmly established in aparigraha janma kathana kathan uh, janma what is this uh, kathanta a uh, sambodha means when the yogi firmly stands on is established in aparigraha or non possession full knowledge of now this is uh, really interesting the how and what state about the past present and future that arises in the yogi's mind now what does it mean swami vivekananda in one place told sister nivedita that what is the function of a guru a guru obviously is a yogi of the highest order a, a ideal guru is the uh, yogi should be a yogi of the highest order so if he if he is established in the virtue uh, of aparigraha which he has to then you will find that he knows has the full knowledge of the past present and future when nivedita asked what is the function of a guru then Sri Ram Krishna, uh, Swami Vivekananda very clearly said, "He who can tell you your past, present, and future is your guru." Obviously, he told it in a very simple way, but how difficult it is. But that comes according to Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, this last niyama, aparigrahasthairiye, ah, uh, janma kathanta asambodha, sambodha, sambodha. That means the how, the why. Uh, and everything about the past present and future of an individual can be seen that is what sri ram krishna did he could see not only the past of somebody all the samskaras he could see what he has to do and he could also guide him and anticipate what he will do in the future and guide a person accordingly so that only a yogi does so now we will come to the but swami ji gives a small explanation in his raj yoga we'll just see aparigraha literally means not accepting gift so on a practical uh, from a practical point of view swami ji tries to explain it this way he says when a man does not receive presents or gifts he does not become beholden to others this is a very pragmatic way of understanding what aparigraha does at a much lower level of course to see the past present and future is a much higher a uh, result of aparigra practiced over several years i mean if one has to be established in that but even at a lower level swami ji says with every gift he is likely to receive the evils of the giver if he does not receive the mind is purified if he does not receive any gifts the first advantage is his mind is purified and 
Swamiji says something wonderful. He says he that he gets a power and he gets the memory of his past life. Now, seeing the past, present and future is explained through this paragraph of Swamiji. He says, then alone yogi becomes perfectly fixed in his ideal. He says that he has been coming and going many times. So, they get an idea of the innumerable lives they have led. So, that gives a kind of vairagya that have I to live this life again and again and again. He sees in his front of his eyes all the stages that he has passed through in this and the previous lives. So the memory of the past is what you get if you are very much particular about this aparigra. So he becomes determined. The consequence of this aparigra is that he becomes determined that I have suffered so much in the past that I don't want any future birth. That kind of vairagya, that kind of detachment to, uh, to rebirth, that intense desire for moksha, mukti, that comes. And he becomes determined and says that this time I will be free. There is no more coming and going. And I shall refuse to be a slave of nature. So for a small thing, a small niyama, like aparigraha, can, if practiced sincerely in letter and spirit, it will take us to the highest freedom. That is the benefit of yama and niyama. And shaucha. From shaucha what happens? He says from shaucha there is a jugupsa, a disgust for one's own body. Now it, it seems to be a very dangerous proposition. If we really hate our body, what do we gain? But the result why we sh uh, that kind of jugupsa means it's a kind of dislike for our own body. The grossness that is associated with our existence. It's, it's definitely not, especially when the body gets old, everybody starts hating. He said, what a, uh, uh, I mean, what a burden this body is, especially when we age, when we, when we become older. So that jugupsa from cleanliness, if cleanliness is established, when we are established in uh, uh, shauchat, means by practicing shaucha, a disinterested, uh, disinterestedness comes. Some uh, we become unconcerned because the Swamiji says the commentator also says that asam sarga asam sarga means contact with other bodies also becomes distasteful. If he hates his own body, then naturally that is the reason why shaucha has to be practiced. So. That is why sometimes it goes to the extreme. We go on cleaning our body. It's not just the physical cleanliness that is meant, but a kind of detachment towards anything that is gross. What do you mean by purity? What do you mean by cleanliness? Cleanliness means trying to be less, as much less gross in our approach to things, objects and other things as possible. Thinking more of the spirit. So that is what he says, not only our own body, asangraha paraihi, paraihi means others' body also is developed. So that gives us, gives rise to some kind of vairagya or detachment. So Swamiji says, now explaining this sutra, when there is real purification of the body, external and internal, there arises a sort of neglect of the body. And the idea of keeping it nice vanishes. A face, Swamiji says, which others call most beautiful, will appear to the yogi as mere animal if there is no spirituality or intelligence behind it. Swamiji once jokingly said, uh, some woman asked him in the West, uh, how do you react when you see a beautiful says, face? Then Swamiji says, the figure, the person who is in front of me, there is no spirituality the most beautiful face appears like a toad, like an ugly toad. So this is what the yogis really feel. If there is no spiritual intelligence, there's no, no spirituality behind it, and the spirit does not shine through it, the what the world calls a beautiful face will appear like a mere animal. So this thirst after body is the greatest bane of life, according to Swamiji. So the first sign of the establishment of purity, according to him, is that you don't care to think that you are a body. 
so the moment we think about our body then keeping it in good order keeping it beautiful keeping it healthy the question arises and then we are obsessed with that so purity comes according to this idea shaucha or true purity comes when you get rid of the uh, body idea so uh, i think i have taken enough time maharaj so sattva shuddhi or uh, that is what is the result of shaucha and these are the five yamas and niyamas and according to patanjali the practice of these yamas and niyamas will prepare a firm ground or a firm foundation for the other uh, uh, angas other limbs of yoga which are far more difficult the pratyahara uh, then the dharana and dhyana this we are unable to do that we are unable to meditate we are unable to concentrate because of these gross things are pulling us so there should be a basic amount of purity or sattva shuddhi which is the goal of yama and niyama as it is evident from the sutra number 41 so we will not discuss that it's a very long sutra the five karmendriyas and gyanendriyas become shuddha satisfaction of the mind comes and finally once one attains sattva shuddhi and then one becomes fit for the practice of yoga that is what these yama and niyamas do so once again i thank rkm very especially swami atmapriyanand ji maharaj for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts and uh, uh, the international day of yoga is fast approaching there are so many wonderful programs i just saw happen to see and i uh, convey my heartiest thanks and congratulations to revered maharaj for Uh, conducting this event and we hope very soon now that the covid is over the covid restrictions are over we'll be seeing swami atma priyanand ji once among uh, once again here in the uk we, we will invite you as and when uh, things become completely normal so thank you once again om shanti 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 ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣಾದಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಾವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು we are extremely thankful to swami sarvastananda ji for a simple wonderful exposition of the yama and niyama in the ashtanga yoga because these things are less discussed than meditation and uh, uh, various changes which take place in meditation and so on so why he very, very beautifully said why we are not able to meditate or concentrate is because we don't take care of the basics as we normally say and when abdul salam the famous nobel laureate um, went to his uh, native place when he came to india he located the primary school mathematics teacher who taught him mathematics in school and went and touched his feet sir it is because of you i could get the nobel prize because the basics are the most vital so we build the building upon very shaky foundation as jesus the christ said you build your building on the sand which is shaky and then the winds came and the gale gale blew and great was its fall and another wise person built his building house upon a rock and the winds blew and the gales came and it could not be shaken because it was built on a rock so the yama niyama the rock the bed rock on which the entire foundation the edifice of yoga is built thank you swami sarvastanand ji for being straight simple direct basing on swami vivekananda's interpretation and fully focused to the topic and finishing in record time <laughs> thank you so much